I found the other day when I was teaching class, uh, a student started to record the lecture and that was fine with me. Uh, but then when I tried to access the lecture later, I couldn't do it. So then I sent an email out to everybody in the class who recorded the class, would you please let me know so that I can put the link up for everybody in the class and nobody responded. <laughs> So it happened again the other day, at which point I was able to manually stop the recording and then start it myself so that I had the link and then could put it up for the rest of the class. It's funny times we live in. I didn't know that students were able to record class without, I thought the host or the co-host could only do that. Well, apparently mine can, and it's probably because I left a button turned on somewhere in the setup. Interesting. If something goes wrong, I generally feel the safest um, explanation is that I'm to blame <laughs> somehow. Me there too. are so many things you need to click, yeah. <laughs> Do you, are you um, going at all to campus? Do you go to campus? I, I was yeah. just there to teach a class uh, on Tuesday night, it was the first time this semester that uh, I ventured into a classroom and zero students showed up for class. Everybody was online. Wow. And, and I may, me and the custodian of the building may have been the only people in the, in the entire building. Our department uh, is completely empty. It's like a ghost town. No one is there. Secretaries aren't there. No, no one is there. I think it, just about now, it's the one year anniversary since I was last in the department. So. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't been to the office, so to speak. I, I've gone to classrooms. I, I just live down the street from the campus, so it's quite easy for me to, to get there. That's handy. Yeah. So what what is it like in uh, Pittsburgh these days in terms of temperature and precipitation? Is it Did it snow for you or not? Uh, today it's rainy, uh, you know, harder and softer at various times, but it's just a, a cloudy day. Yesterday was beautiful. Uh, so we are making our way towards spring, but uh, yeah, the temperature can dip down into just about 30 degrees and then uh, jump up as high as 60. Um, and it's always a little unpredictable. Uh, is everything okay? Everything is okay. If it starts raining, he'll, be, he'll then I'll shoes him out. Okay. I have a dog lying at my feet. So the question was whether or not to leave him, let sleeping dogs lie or move him out. <laughs> so where to keep your feet warm. <laughs> <laughs> we are in uh, the midst of spring down here in Florida and it's sort of warm today. It's like 80 degrees or something. Um, it would be summer for us. So if it's okay with you, I'm not gonna put a coat on. <laughs> I've got a ceiling fan going on over me, but. Um, well, John had joined with a mask, so. <laughs> yeah. You uh, took your mask off. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't know why I put it on. I, I only got up and left the room and came back. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> force a habit. Uh, have you have you all been vaccinated yet? I have not yet. No. My no. sister who lives in the Philadelphia side of the state tells me that um, it's still not working well in Pennsylvania. Yeah, my my brother-in-law and sister-in-law uh, had to travel from Pittsburgh to Grove City yesterday morning in order to wait in line and get a shot. So, uh, and that was by appointment. So that that sounds a little hard to get. Uh, yeah, it does. My sister elected to go to, she lives close to the Delaware border, but to go into Delaware to get a shot. Yeah, yeah uh, Ohio, um, they're like down to 30 year olds or something like that. They, they've started at the, the top of the age group and, and moved down down. So you know, they've been making swift progress and kind of in the right direction. Yeah, that's good. 
I, I, our university organized shots for professors who were 65 and over right in January. So I got my shot a long, long time ago. Something you said for that, good. So I, you know, I could have jumped on a plane and come up there. Of course, I would have been <laughs> with you, the custodian, and no one else in, uh, <laughs> right. in the room. Yeah. <clears throat> Me and my mask, so. Yeah. Ah, there's Dr. Floyd. Uh, Dr. Floyd, uh, if you can hear me, you, you may uh, remember Dr. Murray from 2006 visit. Yeah. I looked it up and you were the one who corresponded with me and met me at the Cathedral of Learning and set everything up so that the lecture would go. We probably did it with um, carousel trays at that point. Uh, okay. I'm not sure if he's hearing us. That might be Mary anyway. Uh, Bill, are your students on campus or are they mostly uh, zooming in from home? We have a very few hybrid classes. All of my, the classes that I'm teaching this semester are both um, online, even the seminar that I'm teaching. Um, there are very few students on campus. Uh, a friend of mine who does teach has, I don't know, 40 students in a class and I think four come to the on-campus class. So, and, and I've, I've been informed that we're all supposed to be front and center for face-to-face -face classes in the fall. That's what we were told. Yeah, and I'll be happy. Although I have not missed uh, fighting for parking places. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love my long commute from my bedroom to my basement. It's, it's great. <laughs> yeah, your normal commute is what uh, like oh close my to normal an hour? oh my gosh hour and a half when i'm coming from yeah. home and when i'm coming from my in-laws it's probably that long because i leave an hour early and then i walk no an hour and a half early because i have a 20 minute walk from where i park to where i teach so where is it that you live i live in johnstown which is south of pittsburgh so during the week, I'll, um, when we're in person, I'll stay with my in-laws. But now, like I said, I've got the very long commute from my bedroom to my basement. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is nice. <laughs> very nice.
Well, we've, we've hit the 430 mark and um, many of you have been waiting patiently for this lecture to begin. So maybe we could make a bit of a start. We should first say a few words about the Archaeological Institute of America itself, uh, which is sponsored for this lecture. Um, the Archaeological Institute of America is a actually international organization um, consisting to a large part of professional archaeologists, but amateurs are welcome to join as well. Um, they have two publications which they are responsible for. One is a, a professional journal. The other is a more popular magazine, Archaeology, which uh, you may be welcome to subscribe to. Um, and if you join as a member, uh, there are different levels of membership, but you can receive these publications uh, as part of your membership. Uh, there are also other programs that are offered. Uh, things are undergoing changes this year due to COVID. So many things are virtual. Things like digs are often suspended, etc. cetera. Um, but you can check their website for further information. And um, they are, as I said, the sponsor for today's lecture. Um, maybe that's enough. Uh, Just trying to work my screen here a little bit. So let me now move on towards introducing our lecture. Um, <clears throat> so, hello, I, I'm John Newell, uh, president of the Pittsburgh chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America. And welcome to our virtual lecture. Um, this is working out well. We're getting better turnouts online than, than we often do in person. But someday we will <clears throat> all return to reality. Uh, but today it might be just as well that we meet online where the weather is always grand. Uh, here. here in Pittsburgh, we're being treated to a gray and rainy day, a great day for sleeping, but weather um, well suited to Ireland. And well, that's my tip of the hat to St. Patrick's Day, which was yesterday. Today, it may be well and good that we find ourselves immersed in water from clouds overhead to rain in the air and puddles underfoot. Or short of a ride in a submarine, it puts us in the environment best suited for today's lecture, which focuses on the tale that undersea excavations and tell us about the final battle of the To that end, I would like to welcome back and introduce Professor William Murray. Uh, as we were discussing earlier, he was last year as a lecturer uh, for the AIA in 2006. And he is no stranger to Pennsylvania, having graduated uh, for his BA from Penn State and from the University of Pennsylvania, where he earned his PhD. So uh, Pennsylvania is not foreign territory. In addition to being the Archaeological Institute of America's Martha Sharp Dworsky lecturer this year, Professor Murray is the Marion Gus Strathis Professor of Ancient History at the University of South Florida, where he is also Director of the University's Ancient Studies Center. I should also like to mention, as it seems relevant to this talk, that Professor Murray also held an appointment as the Leo A. Schifrin Distinguished Professor of Naval and Military History at the U.S. Naval Academy in 2014. Professor Murray's interests embrace all aspects of ancient seafaring, from ships to trade in ancient harbors, on up to naval warfare and weaponry, which is our topic for today. In pursuit of these interests, he has worked at numerous archeological sites, many of them underwater, like our conditions today, uh, and has done work in Greece, Turkey, Israel, France, and Italy over the past four years. You see in today's lecture, he is currently a member of the Agati Island Survey Project, which works on recovering ancient warship rams and other battle debris from the last naval battle of the First Punic War which was fought between the Romans and the Carthaginians off the western coast of Sicily in 241 BC on or about March 10th. So we've just about hit it on the anniversary. And now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor William Murray for his talk, The Anatomy of an Ancient Naval Battle. 
Thank you very much, Professor Newell, for your introduction. I'm happy to be here with you, even if it is a virtual experience. You know, I do feel there's a connection I have with Pittsburgh. As uh, Professor Newell said, I grew up in State College, Pennsylvania. My relatives lived in Ohio, and given the roads uh, at that time, I passed through Pittsburgh a zillion times as a kid and young adult. I also did my student teaching practicum south of the city at a place called Peters Township High School in McMurray, Pennsylvania, back in 1973. So, um, as I say, I, I've been to the city a lot of times, um, and um, I was looking forward to going back, but you know the end of that story. COVID forced these virtual presentations. So I guess we'll just have to make do with this webinar format and I'll make sure that I come to Pittsburgh another time. Good. The lecture this afternoon is titled, as you heard, The Anatomy of a Naval Battle, the Battle of the Igatis Islands. Uh, throughout the lecture, I'll be using the modern Italian name Egidi instead of the Latin Igatis. Uh, we use the Italian name with our Italian colleagues and it rolls off the tongue more easily. So on March 10th, 2,261 years ago, a sea battle was fought between Rome and Carthage off Sicily's northwestern tip in these islands. The victory Rome won here ended the 23 year long First Punic War and determined uh, that she would control Sicily, not Carthage who had been a presence on the island for centuries, particularly in the west of the island. Historians consider the victory Rome won to represent an important turning point in her development toward empire as the Romans took their first step outside of peninsular Italy here, made Sicily their first province and emerged as the superior naval power of the Western Mediterranean. While this battle was admittedly significant, I've chosen to focus on it this afternoon for another important reason. In 2007, we located the debris field from this battle in 70 to 80 meters of water off the northwestern tip of Levenzo Island in the region I've indicated on this view of the Egede Islands from the mountain behind Trapani called Eriche. I just uh, draw, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but I'm circling it around battle zone, which is in the right uh, upper portion of the slide. Now, do you see how these maps work? Um, the upper map is the one that you were just looking at. And uh, the, the the square there indicates a uh, close up on the Egede Islands, which is in the lower right inset map. And the square in that one around the red blob uh, shows you what the main map uh, is looking like, which is uh, the, the bulk of the slide here. So we're just sort of zooming in through those inset maps to the battle debris scatter, which is shown in the, in the main map. For the first time ever, we can compare a scatter of artifacts, and there are about uh, 1,400 of them now, from an ancient naval battle with historical accounts of the action. Our best account of the action was written by a Greek statesman and soldier named Polybius, who lived about a century after the battle took place. Since he couldn't rely on eyewitness accounts, he relied on two contemporary written accounts, one that he tells us was biased toward the Romans and another that was biased toward the Carthaginians. He tells us he tries to take a middle ground. Despite these drawbacks, Polybius's account and the debris field we've found allow us to cross check one with the other which is something you can't yet do for any other naval battle from the ancient Mediterranean. Now, when I say we discovered a debris field, I mean RPM Nautical Foundation, working in partnership with the Sicilian Superintendency of the Sea and divers of global underwater explorers, 
with the occasional assistance of the Italian Coast Guard and others. Let's take a look at what we found. The most spectacular finds, of course, are the warship rams. These are heavy, industrial grade bronze warheads mounted at a warship's bow on the waterline with the purpose of smashing holes in enemy hulls. In all, 23 rams have been found in the battle zone to date, 11 of which you see illustrated here, namely the ones found between 2007 and 2015. We number the rams sequentially as they are found. So, Agate 4, the fourth one found, as it happens during the 2011 survey se season, is the lightest one we've found so far, weighing only 130 kilos. But if you look at it, you'll notice that a portion of its upper starboard fin has cracked off, and that may weigh oh, 12, 13 kilos, so we've got to add that to the weight. By comparison, Egedy 16, which was found in 2018, weighs 225 kilos. The others fall somewhere in between, with the average around 165 kilos. Let me draw your attention to the wood still surviving between the upper two fins of Egedy 16's starboard side. It's a reminder of the primary function of the ram, which is to serve as a weapon to split open enemy wooden hulls, causing breaches in them that then cause the ship to sink or swamp and be put out of action. Many of the rams are decorated with symbols, like the helmet with the three feathers on Agate 8, shown on the left of the slide, and the winged female deity, an early form presumably of the goddess Victory or Victoria on Agate 6. We know these rams here are of Roman ma manufacture from their Latin inscriptions some of which are quite showy, like the large raised letters you see on Agate 6 on the right of the slide. Of the 23 rams, 8.5% of them are of Punic manufacture. Now this is definite identification uh, because of inscriptions that are preserved on the rams. So two of 23 have Punic inscriptions, while 12 of 23, 52% have Latin inscriptions on them. Hopefully we can tell more when the rest have been cleaned. The Latin inscriptions generally record the names of one or two officials called quaestors uh, who were in charge of the production of the rams and they affirm that the quaestors have approved the weapon, which you can see here, pro bawet. The team has also mapped more than 900 amphoras, or two-handled clay shipping containers, including 75 Punic jars, shown on the right, and 827 Greco-Italic jars, shown here on the left. The Greco-Italic jars weigh about 25 pounds when they're empty, and they hold about 7.5 gallons of produce, which means that the 827 jars represent about 6.2 thousand gallons of liquid produce. Additionally, we've found more than 30 helmets, mostly on the surface of the bottom, although the divers have found others buried in the sediments 14 or so centimeters down, some deeper than that. The helmet we call the Griffin helmet must have belonged to somebody important with its elaborate cross piece holder in the shape of a horned bird of prey, which you can see in the lower central image. To the right of it, you see an example of what one of these cross pieces would have looked like in a very simple modern replica. In the case of the Griffin helmet, its cross piece was retained by a cotter pin here where the arrow shows and would have originally held a number of feathers, probably three, like the helmet we saw depicted on Agate 8 and on other rams that we've recovered. Since our divers are now using metal detectors, 
they're finding many more metal objects buried in the sediment, like additional fragmentary helmets and cheek pieces, which you see in the upper left image. Swords, daggers, bronze coins. The top right image shows what's left of an iron sword whose preserved length is 68 centimeters. The iron of the blade has totally disappeared, but it has left a hollow in the concretion preserving its orig original shape, which you can see in the CAT scan image in the lower right. Notice how that gray colored hollow tapers as you move toward the tip of the blade. On the left of the screen, you see one of the many bronze coins that the divers are now finding, bearing the head of Tanit, the chief goddess of Carthage on the obverse, and a horse head on the reverse. For comparative purposes, I present a pristine example from the Royal Collection of Coins and Medals in the Danish National Museum in the lower left of the slide. So these are the kinds of artifacts that are spread throughout the debris field, which currently covers an area of some 15 square kilometers, which is almost six square miles. One of my jobs on the project is to make sense of this scatter of artifacts that was deposited almost 23 centuries ago. During my lecture this afternoon, I'd like you to come along with me as I ponder the problems involved. Since we know the scatter was produced by a naval battle, we should logically approach the problem of what the scatter represents by considering what went into a sea battle of this period. First of all, we need to know something about the warships that fought in the battle. Second, we need to know the strategic objectives that brought the combatants together at this particular place and at this particular time. Third, we need to know how each side fought in this battle. In other words, what their standard battle tactics were. And finally, we need to understand the physical environment of the battle zone, primarily, the winds, the currents, the sea state on the day of the battle, and so forth. Let's start with the ships. Ancient navies, like modern ones, utilized different kinds of warships that were optimized for different purposes. Some utilized their ships as simple floating platforms from which the combatants fought as if they were in an infantry battle. In the early years of the First Punic War, Polybius tells us that the Romans fought this way. And so they developed early on a device that was called a crow in Latin corvus that served as a heavy boarding bridge. It had a big spike on its end um, so that when it stood erect on the prow, the spike sticking out looked like a crow's beak apparently. Um, and uh, when it was dropped onto an enemy deck, the spike uh, firmly affixed itself to the, the wooden deck of the enemy ship, and it kept the two ships firmly bound together and served as a means for Roman soldiers to board the enemy ship. The Carthaginians, on the other hand, used their ships as the main offensive weapon, and that's what I try to indicate in the lower right image. The oar crews and pilots worked as teams to drive their ships like floating battering rams into the hulls of enemy ships aiming to break holes in them, thus causing them to sink or swamp to the water's surface. The weapon they employed to do this was a bronze ram, which we've seen mounted carefully on their ship's bow at the waterline. The first large ram with wood still attached to it was found off the coast of Israel at a place called Atlit in 1980. You can see the location of the place on the right map, the map that's at the right of the slide. From the study of this artifact, we can see that such weapons were carefully constructed to focus the shock of the ramming maneuver on the enemy vessel, while at the same time transferring the recoil forces of the ramming blow to the bottom timbers of its own ship, outlined here in this pink box. And the timbers, the big timbers that would have been the shock absorber timbers, were the port whale timber. There was an equal one on the right side of the ship, the starboard whale timber, and then the bottom timbers, which you can see indicated in the, in the drawing. As you'd expect, 
the ancients developed different kinds of ramming warships for different purposes. Some were pretty large, while others were small. And it seems that the ram increased in size depending upon the size of the ship. The Greeks and Romans differentiated their ship designs with a number based upon the complexity of its oar system. For example, they called the smallest ship single splashers. The Greek term is monokratos. We call them ones. And they had one level of oars per side with each oar pulled by a single man as shown in the upper image. Twos or dikrotoi, dikrotoi or double splashers had two levels of oars, which I've highlighted here so that you can see what I mean. Single oar on the single level of oars on the top, double level of oars on the bottom. The next size up, they called the three fitted warship. The Greeks called it a trieres, and the Romans called it a triremis. Threes had three levels, each with one man pulling a single oar, as you see in the upper right image. Can you see how the grouping of these three oars repeats down the side of the ship in the upper left image? The number in the grouping seems to determine the ship class. Since there were never more than three levels of oars, or at least we have no evidence for it, the bigger ships like fours and fives placed multiple men on single oars. For example, we think a four in the center of the images that I've got there, uh, placed two men per oar at two different levels. Following this model, a 10 might have had two levels of five man oars. Now I say might because this is all conjecture. We're trying to make sense of the names that survived for us and the few descriptions of these ships that let us know how large uh, they were. Because it balanced cost with performance, the three or the trireme was the most popular class and was used for the longest period of time. As a result, it's the class about which we know the most and the one for which a hypothetical model named Olympias was reconstructed by the Hellenic Navy and the Trireme Trust during the 1980s. The principal uh, investigators were John Morrison and John Coates, which I've indicated their names beneath the trireme replica. The Olympias attempts to show a three of the late fifth, early fourth century BC, a ship that we know from numerous descriptions was able to accelerate quickly, turn sharply, reverse direction smartly, and deliver a ramming blow of sufficient strength to shatter steering oars from the rear or splinter an enemy hull. Athenian threes of this period had a full crew of 200 men, which included 170 oarsmen, 14 marines, and they were comprised of 10 hoplites and four archers, and the rest were officers 16. The rest uh, were officers, sailors, and deckhands. The ships themselves were about 125 feet in length, about 38 meters, and about 18 feet in breadth from side to side, about five and a half meters. They were light enough for a group of 120 men to drag one out of the water. And we know these details from inscriptions that survive in Piraeus and from garages in which these ships were stored to keep them out of the elements. That's what gives us the dimensions. The Romans also built threes, and their version of the class seems to have differed from the Athenian version. We should suspect that the Roman version had fewer oarsmen, I'd guess between 140 or 150, with a capacity to carry at most 40 Marines on deck. From the time of the First Punic War until Augustus at the turn of the era, the Romans seem to have preferred a class of ship called a quinquireme or five. Since we have no evidence for more than three levels of oars, there certainly were not five men on a single oar. We're pretty sure the Punic version, the Punic War version of this class 
was rowed by three levels of multiple manned oars. Two men on a single oar at the top. If you can see in the, the image that I've shown there, there are two men sitting side by side at the top. Two men on a single oar in the middle and one man on a single oar at the bottom. A full oar crew with officers numbered 300 men. And on one occasion, when the Romans invaded North Africa, their fives carried 120 Marines on deck. So the ship could carry 420 people. The standard contingent of Marines, that is, on a five seems to have been about 40, but we know that both the Romans and Carthaginians added soldiers from the army before set battles. A possible measure of the ship's size can be found in a ship monument set up on the Tiber Island in Rome. In this image, you see it paired with a marble ram of similar size found associated with a funerary monument at Ostia, the port city of Rome. I also include one of the Egedi rams so that you can see the difference in scale between what I think probably represents the ram of a five and the ram of a Roman three. If I'm even vaguely correct, then you can imagine the result when a Roman five ran head on into a Roman three. It'd be like a truck hitting a compact car. Okay, our next step is to consider briefly the strategic objectives of the combatants. In other words, what were the Carthaginians and Romans trying to achieve through their participation in this particular battle? For this, you really need the backstory of the First Punic War, which started in 264 BC, when Rome moved some troops across the narrow straits separating Italy from Sicily and gained a foothold on the eastern end of the island shown in the oval. For 20 years, Rome and Carthage fought each other to a stalemate, each trying to oust the other from the island, each side losing hundreds of ships in battles and in storms, draining both their treasuries in the process. 20 years into the war, the Romans borrowed money from the richest citizens to build a new fleet of 200 warships for one last stab at driving Carthage from Western Sicily. Polybius, our main guide for the war, tells us that the fleet was totally comprised of fives and that they put to sea during the summer of 242 under the command of the consul Gaius Lutatius Catulus. His orders were to gain control of the seas around the island and coordinate with the army in the west to starve out the Carthaginians from their bases. So Lutatius went from Sicily, went to Sicily, and put pressure on a garrison of Carthaginian soldiers camped on the side of Mount Eryx near the city called Drepana, modern Tropani. Now, as this garrison ran low on supp supplies, they presumably sent to Carthage for help. You can see Carthage indicated on the lower left slide of the map. It's not that far away, about 140 kilometers, something like that. Carthage, it appears, was totally caught off guard, at least Polybius tells us this, by the Roman fleet in Western Sicily. And as a result, hurriedly threw together their own naval force, loaded it with grain and other supplies, and sent it off to a small harbor on the Western side of Eryx that the garrison controlled. Their plan was to offload their supplies, take on deck soldiers, as was common, from the garrison, and fight for control of the seas. The strategic objectives for both sides were then pretty straightforward. The Romans needed to crush the relief force before it could offload supplies and take on fresh troops. And the Carthaginians needed to elude the Romans enough to land their supplies and then drive the Roman fleet from Western Sicily. So now we come to the fighting. And the important thing to keep in mind is that this was not a typical naval battle. A lot of what took place depended upon the physical environment of this particular battle. As I told you before, in the early, early battles of the war, the Romans relied on their boarding bridges. 
But as the war progressed, we see that they became more adept at using the vessels skillfully as ramming weapons. In fact, we're told that Lutatius had been drilling his crews until they became skilled and effective teams. He made sure they were well fed. He increased their confidence through continual practice and thus he prepared them for action. Then on the day of the battle, we're told, we're not told this, but we can surmise it, a front, a weather front blew through, a low pressure system so that in the morning, the wind blew from the Southwest. And as the day progressed, the wind changed direction in a clockwise manner. There was apparently a long sea swell and the brisk wind made the surface of this long swell rough as well. These were not good conditions for battle. In general, Naval commanders chose periods of calm weather for naval battles because their warships lowest ore ports were close to the water. In the trireme replica, they're like within 12 inches of the sea surface. And as the sea surface got rough, it would slop water in the lower, the lower ports. They had protective devices on them, but they could slop water in the middle ports. Threes were affected by this more so than were fives. When suitable weather presented itself, the fleets in a normal battle generally lined up opposite one another in what is called a line abreast formation, somewhere close to shore, with their sides parallel to one another and their bows toward the enemy, lined up sort of like uh, uh, the front lines of American football teams before the, the play begins. The battle began when both sides charged head first at one another, something this artist is trying to depict. The dashed line here shows where the two fleets are meeting prow to prow. During the charge, the Marines on board the warships tried to kill enemy deck soldiers with ranged weapons like slings or bows and arrows or javelins, or in some instances, catapults, but catapults were not in this battle. And then just before impact, the Marines held on for dear life so as not to be thrown overboard by the impact of collisions. Threes were at a disadvantage when fighting against larger ships. Uh, and so they tried to shoot the gap between enemy ships so as not to be uh, struck prow to prow. Their object was to shear off the enemy's oars as they passed by. They could even then execute a turning maneuver in order to attack the enemy in the rear. And then they could put the steering oar of the enemy ship out of action. Enemy ships immobilized in this way were then left until the end of the battle. And if uh, the attacking side won, then they returned to the ships that were put out of action and um, attacked them with multiple ships at once. Those on the larger ships before the battle took place braced for the collisions, then after they occurred, quickly resumed firing at the enemy, trying to kill as many deck soldiers as they could. Their four deck men surveyed the damage and relayed it back to the helmsman who would then communicate with the crew about whether to back up the vessel for another try or not. If a ship became entangled with the enemy or was critically damaged in the first charge, its Marines might leap from one ship to another. Those on sinking ships had little other choice but to board an enemy ship if they could and overwhelm their opponents so that they could take the undamaged ship for themselves. As this graphic view implies, sea battles were extremely noisy, they were chaotic, they were unsettling, and they were stressful. So what about our battle on March 10th, 241 BC? I've already told you about the best account by Polybius and that it was written about a century after the battle. When we add in a few details that were mentioned by other later accounts of the battle, the following outline narrative emerges. On the day before the battle, 
Lutatius, that would be then the ninth, Lutatius was informed by lookouts that the Carthaginian fleet had arrived at what they called the sacred island. That's modern day Maretimo on the left of the, of the image. And he prepared his men for action on the morning of the following day. On the morning of the 10th, when the Carthaginian fleet got underway, the Romans left their base on Favignana, which is the lower, the southernmost of the three Egedi Islands. They ducked behind Levanzo Island, which is the, to the, uh, uh, the uppermost, I guess, of the three Egedi Islands, to make use of calm water on the east side of it. And then they took up a position northwest of Capo Grosso, the northern point of the island, in a single line abreast formation to block the enemy's passage. They lined up like bulldozers, hoping to stop the enemy from getting by. The day was windy, the seas were rough, but even though this was the case, Lutatius decided that a chance to catch the enemy without lots of Marines on board yet and loaded down with supplies was worth the risks posed by the waves. And anyway, he had been schooling his men in fighting in tough conditions. When the Carthaginians saw the Romans forming into a line that blocked their passage, they had no other option but to douse their sails, lower their masts, and try to bulldoze their way past the enemy. Now, in this image, the lower line would be the Roman fleet, and the upper gaggle or straggle of vessels would be the Carthaginian fleet. As I've said, because they spent months training, Polybius says that the Romans quickly routed the Carthaginians, sinking 50 ships and capturing 70 with their crews. Luckily for the defeated, the wind from the pressure system change had clocked around toward the northeast during the battle, which allowed the Carthaginian survivors to raise their sails and return to Maretimo on a favorable wind. And from there, they proceeded back to Carthage. Although our other sources do not present the same casualty totals as does Polybius. Look at the left column of numbers under Carthage in particular. You'll see that the different numbers that are represented in that column. All the authors uniformly agree that the victory forced the Carthaginians to sue for peace on terms extremely favorable to the Romans. So regardless of the exact numbers, the Carthaginian casualties, both in terms of lost men and lost warships, must have been considerable. Now, here comes the fun part, where we get to look at the debris field and see if it tells us anything new. You've seen this image before, but now we need to look at the patterns hidden in the scatter of artifacts. Remember, that the red and white dots represent storage, clay storage jars, amphoras, while the yellow triangles and blue pentagons represent warship rams and bronze helmets, respectively. Let's focus on these four different kinds of artifacts. Note that the ram positions, which you can barely make out in this slide, are in a line that corresponds to a line abreast course around Levenzo Island. Here's the line abreast course that the Carthaginians took. Now, the rams, the fact that the rams are still in a line, here, let me point them out to you there, implies the ships lost their rams quickly because if the ships had not been sunk at the same time and quickly, they would be in different positions. They would be out of a line abreast formation. And if the rams had floated with surface wreckage uh, for hours, then the currents and winds would have separated them before they sank and they'd not still be in a line. So all of this must have happened rather quickly. That's important observation number one. From the ramps themselves, we learn three additional details that don't appear in Polybius's account. First of all, as we've already seen, the rams can't come from fives 
because the ships that they fit on are too small. There's no way you can put 420 men on a ship that corresponds to an eggity size ram, at least according to our current understanding of ship construction. Most likely, these ram come from smaller ships than fives, perhaps from threes. The fleets of this battle obviously had a mix of warships and they were not all fives, as Polybius tells us they were. Second, the groupings seem to imply separate lines, which would make sense if we have squadrons of ships that are slightly separated from one another, and that's what you would expect with an ocean passage. And third, since more than 50% of the rams thus far discovered come from Roman ships, and the number may actually be higher than 50%, these rams must come from ships the Carthaginians took from the Romans back in 249 when they captured more than 90 ships at Drepana and sent at least 73 of them back to Carthage. Now let's look at the more than 900 amphoras, which make perfect sense as containers for supplies to relieve the garrison on Mount Eryx. Their presence in the scatter makes sense. But what about their spread out distribution? Why aren't they in clumps associated with each of the struck warships? If we zoom in on the scatter around Agate 10, which is uh, indicated by the dotted box, you can see more clearly what I mean. Keep your eye on the yellow triangle at the bottom of that white dotted rectangle as the scales change. At this scale that I'm showing you right now, each red dot, which represents an amphora, still measures 25 meters in diameter, and the triangle representing Agate 10 has sides of 54 meters. See that area inside the white rectangle that looks like a cluster of amphoras? Well, here's what it looks like when the red dots sized, when the red dots are sized to 1.4 meters in diameter. Still too large, but um, they spread out even more if we get down to the 40 some centimeters of the real dimensions of the vessel. The cluster goes away. In reality, the amphoras are not at all clustered together like you'd find if they sank inside the hull of a ship. And if they were clustered like that, they'd be touching one another and they're not. Perhaps you can see why we thought the pattern might be produced by deck soldiers throwing amphoras overboard as the ships tried to escape after they had been damaged. Or we thought maybe a strong current was sweeping these jars away one from another. During the summer of 2019, after years of pondering patterns like this, we carried out an experiment in the battle zone designed to record the behavior of amphoras and helmets as they fell from the surface to the seafloor during periods of high and low surface current. Rather than use real amphoras, we thought about it for a second and then dismissed it. We had a local potter make six replicas for us based on the jars that we had been finding. We sent him to the local museum. Um, he saw the correct period, third century BC jar, uh, measured, uh, uh, recorded its weight, and then went and made these jars for us. Now he was used for used to making replicas for uh, museums in the area, so it's not as if we just you know pulled somebody off the street. The helmet replicas that we used were a bit light, so we added two pounds of weight to two of them by gluing a sheet of lead to the interiors. The heavier helmets weighed a little over two kilos and the light one weighed 1.3 kilos. The real helmets we were finding weighed some of them a little under three kilos and some of them a little over three kilos. So these were light, but we figured they would give us the same sort of action that a real helmet would give if we dropped it from the surface. For our first test, we dropped five artifacts, two heavy helmets, and one light one, because we wanted to see whether they differed in the way they moved, plus an amphora filled with water, which has the same buoyancy or specific gravity as wine, and another that was filled with olive oil. 
You see here a plot of one of our heavy helmets as it fell through 82 meters of water to the bottom. We got this plot by attaching a small sonar mini beacon to the helmet that was tracked by our ship's positioning system. Once the artifacts had been dropped, we logged their positions and plotted them on our map. This slide shows the results of the first drop, which are pretty instructive. The amphora filled with olive oil behaved differently than the one filled with fresh water because olive oil is lighter than water with a specific gravity of 0.9 as compared to 1.0. And for this reason, its jar was slightly, slightly more buoyant in the water. And so amphora six was carried almost 11 meters further from the drop point than the water amphora A2. We can see something similar with the helmets of different weights. The lighter helmet, H3, traveled almost three meters further from the drop point than did the heavier helmet, H2. Our second day of trials showed us why the amphora spread out so much. When we released an empty amphora, it floated upside down, which is what we expected would happen. If you go to any body of water and throw in a Coke bottle, the same thing will occur. But when we released an amphora filled with durum wheat, it too floated for about an hour before we fished it out of the water. Almost a kilometer away, down current. We found that when an amphora was filled to the base of its neck with grain, and the grain has a specific gravity of 0 0.8, it was slightly buoyant and sank only when water seeped into the jar and displaced some of the air. How fast this occurred depended upon how full the jars were, how they were sealed, and how they were stoppered, variables that made some of the jars float for minutes and others float for an hour or more and explains their spread out distribution pattern. Because of evidence like this, particularly the painting shown in this slide, it's a first century fresco in the Vatican Museum. One normally thinks of grain being shipped in sacks, but when the carrier was a warship where there was little space in the hold, it's likely that the Carthaginians decided to place their grain in stoppered amphoras tied down on the decks. Our little experiment explained how we could have at least two kinds of distribution patterns, and we see them both in this scatter around Agate 10. When the specific gravities are 0.9 and higher, wine and helmets, <laughs> and the depth is around 80 meters, artifacts can move roughly 16 to 33 meters from their release points as they drop through the 80 to 85 meters of water column to the bottom. They can be spaced meters apart from one another on the bottom, even though they go into the surface at the same point. A mix of five helmets and amphoras filled with oil and wine landed relatively close to one another and produced the pattern of artifacts such as we see here in this cluster of helmets southwest of Egedy 10. This pattern here implies a northeast to southwest current at the battle's end. When the amphoras held contents with specific gravities of 0 0.8 or less, the jars can float for varying periods of time, and this produces a pattern where artifacts can move hundreds of meters from their relief, release points and be spread many meters apart from one another. Precisely the kind of scatter we see represented by most of the widely scattered red and white dots in the figure. Let's take one last look at our naval battle, considering all the evidence we now have at our disposal. At first light on the morning of March 10th, when the Carthaginians left the eastern side of Maretimo Island, here, look where Maretimo is, let's get them on their way, there they go. They did so in squadrons, as was usual for a fleet making a sea passage. If there were around 200 ships, as we're told, 
and the squadrons were comprised of 30 ships each, which is admittedly a guess, this means there were at least seven groupings of ships. Our cluster of rams in the debris field may represent ships from perhaps three squadrons. Here's another way to look at the same data. Once the battle started, it seems to have been concluded quickly, as Polybius tells us, with many indications of violent, perhaps frontal collisions. Egedy 2 and 5 were literally blown apart by the impact collision. Egedy 4 had a fin sheared off, and Egedy 16 still has wood stuck in its fin, presumably from the ship it attacked. We're still pondering what happened to Egedy 3, which has got, uh, again, the edges of the fins are, are knocked off, but we've got this curious V-shaped uh, dent that occurs in the upper two fins and not in the bottom fin. Exactly how that occurred, I'm not sure. Once hulls were breached and broken open, because the sea was rough, that broke the ships apart more quickly. Men fell overboard, rams plummeted to the seafloor, and amphoras were released into the sea. Some items fell quickly to the bottom, carried toward the southwest for roughly 16 to 33 meters by a northeast current. And finally, when all the fighting was over and the heavy objects had disappeared into the depths, the sea's surface was still littered with bobbing amphoras that floated toward Maretimo Island, shown here as a backdrop to our crew going to fetch the one amphora we loosed filled with wheat. And yes, I've photoshopped some amphoras into the scene for effect. This is undeniably a unique place. And I must confess, we all feel it when we're on site. When I'm out on deck, looking at the island like this, I can then close my eyes and see lines of warships and sense the tension that once hung over the quiet vista of today. And then I go below to the control room and I feel the loss of life implied by an empty helmet sitting silently on the seafloor 270 feet beneath me. Here, in this unique place, we have a chance to recover the kinds of detail that we never get from historical accounts, and that's what makes this site so exciting. Is there more to find? Yes, those of us on the team think so. For one thing, we still need to find a ram from one of the fives that fought in the battle. We think these weapons might weigh three or four times the weight of the ones that we've been finding. We must also help the divers develop a methodology for excavating areas around the rams, like the one area the size of a warship between Egedy 15 and 16, where divers have found swords, helmets, and coins. And finally, we need to continue our search for new areas of conflict by means of advanced technology like this autonomous underwater vehicle, or AUV, which will allow us to cover larger swaths of the seafloor in a shorter period of time and alert us to artifacts we can then check by visual inspection with the larger ROV that we have. In fact, we're currently reviewing sonar records recorded by this very AUV this past October. With each additional season we spend at this site, we'll be able to put more flesh on the bones of this battle using archeological evidence um, that exists for no other naval battle from antiquity. There's no doubt in my mind that there will be more to come from this site in the years ahead. And with each new discovery, we'll add more detail to the anatomy of the battle that set Rome on a path toward empire. Thank you. Let's see if I can get... screen off share. There we go. Yes. 
Thank you so much. That was fantastic. It looks like you have a couple questions in the chat. So perhaps we'll start with those. And then if anyone has a question for Professor Murray, please raise your blue hand in the participant pane, or you could put a question in the chat. And it also could be that you don't have a blue hand in the participant pane and you have to go to reactions, but we will get to you. So the first question is, uh, why are you finding more Roman than Punic artifacts if the Romans won the battle and presumably lost a lower number of ships than their adversaries? Um, it's a good question and one that we've struggled with. And I think that the answer has to be that at least in the section of the battle zone that we have found here, what we have uh, so far is we have a, a, a group of what I would call repurposed warships. Um, this was toward the end of a war that was very um, stress, stressful on the treasuries of both sides. The Romans uh, put their fleet in the water by going to the wealthiest citizens in Rome and borrowing money from them. We have no way of knowing how the Carthaginians managed to um, uh, put their fleet in. However, it looks as if they reused some of the 73 ships that were captured from the Romans in 249 BC at a nearby port called Drepana. This is Tropani. This is the base that we sail out of. And uh, we are told that there were 93 ships that were captured. And of the 93 ships, um, there were uh, I, I, there were thirty that were left behind, uh, and six sorry sixty three of them were sent back to Carthage. So they obviously took these ships and they laid them up in their shipyards. And uh, eight years later, when it there was a crisis on their hands, they decided to press these ships into service and they utilized them for this battle. And the Romans sank their old own ships. I think that's the, the only explanation that I can come up with that will make sense with what we know about this particular battle, because you're absolutely correct. You would expect that the overwhelming majority of uh, struck ships should be Carthaginian ships. And at least as of now, remember, there's still, uh, what do we have? 12 plus two is 14 from 23 is nine. So we have nine ships two of which uh, are those uh, rams that were blown apart. We'll never know what manufacturer they were because the top part of the, the ram that would have had the inscription on it was lost, unless we find that top part of the ram and we hope that maybe we do. Um, and the others, the Carthaginians don't seem to put so much um, uh, self-advertisement on their rams as, as the Romans do. So another question. question concerns the construction of the rams. Um, were they made of solid bronze or did they have a core of wood or lead? The ram itself is a envelope. So think of the ram as it's hollow. So if you were to look inside the ram, if I showed you inside the back ram, at the back of the ram, it would be totally hollow. And what it did was that ram fit around the bow timbers of the warship that carried it. And then they, they slipped the ram on the bow timbers of the warship that carried it and then took large spikes and drove them through holes in the ram into those timbers so that the ram itself was uh, firmly affixed onto the bow of the warship. So uh, the ram itself uh, at uh, you know, 300 and some pounds uh, the one is much more than that. It's 225 kilos. It's, it's uh, over 400 some pounds. Um, the ram itself, as I say, is this big honking industrial grade bronze, which was made incredibly heavy. Um, and although it's got some beautiful designs on it, it's very much like a, a cannon in the sense that it's a functional piece of hardware that was meant to inflict damage on the enemy. But it, it's a hollow artifact 
that uh, was filled with uh, the timbers of the bow of the warship that carried it. And it, we presumably it was put on with tons of pitch. So um, it, the ram itself was actually modeled on the bow of the warship that uh, that would eventually carry it. They modeled it on the on the bow of the warship. They went and cast the ram, and then they brought the ram back and put it on the warship. And we know that because no ram is symmetrical. Each ram is uniquely asymmetrical, and that makes sense only if the ram itself was built up on the existing asymmetrical timbers of the warship that it was intended to eventually grace. So another question is about the use of space on the ship. Did these ships normally dock to cook or sleep or were there fires or sleeping space on board? The entire ship space on in the interior was taken up with oarsmen. So there is no place to sleep, uh, presumably no place for a toilet. Um, what these ships did was presumably people relieved themselves in the bottom of the ship and they would wash out the hull. Um, there, uh, these ships were accompanied by supply fleets and they, if they went on a long journey, they would be supplied by ships that would carry um, tents for the men, cooking equipment for the men. Uh, and um, uh, you would, if you, if you had a fleet like this, make arrangements with the communities uh, into whose harbor you would be putting so that the community would bring a market out for you. And then uh, the men on board the ship would be given enough money so that they could purchase items from the market and make their own dinners or make their own lunches. Uh, presumably they brought with them things like uh, bags that carried cheeses and uh, bread pieces and maybe garlic. Uh, the examples that we get for this sort of thing come more from um, little lines in Aristophanes' plays uh, than they do for the Romans. We don't have the same kind of evidence for the Romans, but we figure it must have been roughly the same. We're still struggling with where is water car carried aboard these ships? Did every crew member bring a little skin of water with them? Or uh, was there a central supply of water somewhere? Uh, we're, we're not certain about that. We have small amounts of tableware that are scattered throughout the battle site. And maybe eventually after analyzing the positions of everything, we'll be able to determine whether there is a correlation between pitchers and cups and, and warship rams. But at this point, we haven't done that yet. For the next question, I'm going to correlate a few of them together. So there's some in interest in whether you found things that you haven't shown us. So are there additional weapons that have been found that, ha that we haven't seen, additional p pieces of ships or body armor such as um, breastplates, cuirasses? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, the underwater divers had a season in uh, October of last year, and I just received their report. So I, I know what is in that report. There uh, are a number of helmet pieces, pristine cheek pieces from helmets, a number of blades uh, that have not yet been fully analyzed, many more coins, uh, some pieces probably uh, it looks like of, of maybe body armor, um, I didn't feel like I could show that until uh, we have a group discussion amongst ourselves about how that information will be released and we take our cue from the Italian colleagues uh, with whom we work. So the answer to your question is yes. However, I would say the, the most spectacular finds I was, I was able to show you. Uh, so the next question wonders whether there's any indication that this battle affected naval technology on either side. Did this battle affect naval technology on either side? A short answer to that is no. Um, I don't believe so. If you believe Polybius, 
what he, and I'm not sure I believe Polybius so much about a lot of the details concerning this battle and concerning his description of how the Roman naval establishment developed in the period from 264 to 241 of this battle. But nevertheless, if you believe Polybius, he says that the Romans managed to get their hands on a top of the line, cutting edge, new design Carthaginian warship in 249 BC, and that they used that warship as an example from which all of the ships were built in this particular fleet, the fleet that fought in this particular battle. So we've, according to Polybius, we have reached the end of the evolutionary process that saw the Romans going from land lubbers and not knowing how to build ships to the process of having the latest technology because they managed to capture one of these fancy ships. Um, I think the, um, the jury is out on all of that because we'll need to, I'm not sure how much we can infer. I am not a shipbuilding expert. I'm not sure how much we can infer from the design of the warship just based on the design of the rams. And that's primarily what we have at this point in time. And we can tell from at least my non-expert opinion is that the, the ram design for the Carthaginian rams looks very, very similar to the Roman rams. And if you have accepted my version of the explanation for why the Roman rams are there, most of the Roman rams we are seeing should correspond to ships that were built before the fancy evolutionary adoption of the new style warship that occurred after 249. Because if I'm right, these ships were built before 249 and were captured by the Carthaginians and then sent back to be repurposed. And they look exactly to me like the Carthaginian design. Now, it's very possible that the design of the warship up at the bow doesn't reflect some of the special bells and whistles that made the warships faster, uh, the Carthaginian warships faster than the Roman warships. So the, the original question that I've sort of danced around was, does this battle change anything as far as future technology goes or the development of naval warfare? And I would say my non-expert opinion at this point is, no, I don't see where it, it has a big impact on the design of warships going forward. Uh, talking, speaking of the design of the battering ram, that's a good segue to the next question, which focuses on that. So it seems that there's three horizontal fins divided by a vertical wedge. Did the horizontal fins serve any purpose related to how the ship moved in the water or were they designed to be purely an instrument of destruction and why that particular shape? This particular shape has now existed for a number of centuries. The three finned ram probably goes back to the sixth century BC. Um, and uh, the, the, the fins, according to J. Richard Steffi, who examined the Israeli ram, he believes that the fins are there so that they overlap seams of strakes or, bot or, or bottom timbers of the warship so that they actually extend beyond the joins between adjacent planks. He thought, and, and I'm not sure how his theory is accepted now um, by my colleagues who study warship ramps. But his theory was that when one ship hit another, the idea was to depress the hull timbers to such an extent that the timbers themselves split apart and that you didn't create a hole in the side of the enemy vessel that would cause your vessel to get stuck in the hull. 
you wouldn't want that to happen because if you hit a vessel, let's say that was going 90 degrees, I don't think they would want to do that anyway. But if you did, you were crazy enough to hit a vessel going to uh, its vector was 90 degrees to your uh, uh, vector, then if you punched a hole in the enemy ship, as it moved forward, it would put incredible transverse stress on your bow timbers. And there's a big discussion about whether it would rip your bow off or not. Um, we do have two or three instances where ancient authors tell us that bows, warship rams were ripped off their warships. I think most likely it was likely that you tried to go and alter your course right before your ramming blow to approach at an at a oblique angle uh, the vector that your enemy was going so that you sort of took it in the quarter. And if you made a hole in the enemy hull, the, the hull of the attacked ship would pull away from you and pull out. Um, frequently, however, we hear about warships that are almost motionless and uh, warships would get literally stuck in an enemy warship and then they would have to back water or tell the oarsmen to literally row backwards to pull the ship out of the hole that they that it created. Now back to the fins. The fins, according to Steffi, were spread far enough apart so that they overlapped the seams and caused the seams to deflect inward, which would make the planks spring apart. The planks of an enemy ship were held together not by caulking, they were held together by um, uh, things that looked like tongue depressors, that looked like the teeth of a comb. So each plank would have, one side of the plank would have teeth sticking out of it that were called tenons, and the plank that was adjacent to it would have receptacles carved into it that were called mortises, and the receptacles would take the tenons, the, the teeth from the bottom plank would fit into the holes in the upper plank so that the two planks were held side by side with all of these interlocking tongue depressors that were all along the length of the plank. Then what they would do would be to put a peg through the tongue depressor in the upper plank and a peg through the tongue depressor in the bottom plank and then when the boat got in the water, the planks would swell, the tongue depressors would swell, the pegs would swell, and everything would be tightly held together. So tightly held together that the planks would not leak. They were also incredibly strong. Well, according to Steffi, if you hit those planks from the side, you would cause the tongue depressors to spring out of the holes the planks would separate and would open up, he told me, like Venetian blinds that you opened. And that once the planks, the adjacent planks sprang apart, they couldn't go back together. And there was nothing the crew could do to plug up that hole. The, the Venetian blinds would open, the water would come pouring in. That was his theory for the reason for the, uh, the distance between the lateral or horizontal fins. Others believe they were just cutting devices and that their device, that their purpose was if you hit the enemy ship at an angle, these fins were sticking out. So they increased the surface of the, of the, of the ram. Essentially, you didn't have to hit the ram straight on. You could hit at an oblique angle and the corner of the fin would still cut into the enemy ship and cause damage. Whatever, it turned out to be a design that worked well enough that it continues for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it seems to go out of use when we get to the first or second century AD and you take a look at Trajan's column and you can take a look at the, the warships which are there, those are river warships to be sure, but they seem to have single pointed beaks. Um, they may have continued making these three finned rams into the second and third century, but to my knowledge, we don't have, I don't think we have iconographical evidence for it. But from the period of the sixth century down, certainly to the first century, 
this was the favored design for Mediterranean warships. It was a, it was a great question. And I'm afraid I may have confused you with the answer because I didn't really have good um, visual images to help with the explanation. Not at all. You did a great you did a great job making the images with your words and drawing those images. And uh, there's another question about um, distribution. So the reused ships explain the ratio of rams. However, it seems that the Greco-Roman amphorae also outnumber the Carthaginian Canaanite amphorae. How can this be explained? Here's, here's the cool thing about uh, a battle like this. Warships never, warships going into battle typically strip for action. They take their mast off. They take the sails off. They take anything that's extra heavy weight off because you want the vessel to be as light and nimble as possible. So the Romans, before they went into battle, took everything off their warships. This is just you know the normal way a naval battle is fought. The Carthaginians, however, were on a sea passage and they were bringing relief supplies to a garrison. So they were encumbered with uh, amphoras. Every amphora on the seafloor is a Carthaginian amphora. Whether it's a Greco-Italic amphora or whether it's a Punic amphora, which is fascinating. It shows us that like in the Hellenistic period when people like Andrea Berlin talk about there being a Hellenistic koine, a kind of pottery that, that you find in Syria, you find it in, in Israel, you find it in Egypt. Um, there is a koine, a, a Mendian. There is a, a particular kind of amphora used in the fifth century in the Chalcidice, which is uh, uh, to the northeast of Attica up on the northern shores of the, of the the, the Aegean Sea. The Mendian koine, we now don't believe that all of the Mendian amphoras come from Mendi itself. That it was a kind of amphora that was utilized that is a regional type of amphora. So the, the Greco-Italic amphoras that we find in southern um, Italy, we find them in Campania, we find them in Sicily, we find them in northern Africa, it's cool because it apparently is a koine kind of amphora. Either that or what we're finding is we're finding, and I believe that that's the case. You could also explain it by saying the economies of the Carthaginian sphere and the economy of the Roman sphere of influence are so intertwined at this point that they're reusing storage containers from one another. So either we've got a reuse of, and I don't believe that's the case. I, I believe it's more likely the case. And I think there is a kiln evidence to show that Greco-Italic amphoras, which were named because they were initially found in Greco-Italic areas of Italy, those Greco-Italic amphoras are also being made along the North coast of Africa. I think that's the correct answer. So. My view of this is all that stuff that we find on the seafloor that should not be on the Roman ships because they were stripped for action, all that stuff comes from Punic ships. On the topic of amphorae, is it possible that they were being used as weapons? I'd like, this is one where I really wish we were face to face because I guess I would like to know from the, the questioner what he or she has in mind. We know there is a, a, a weapon that um, merchant ships use, which were called lead amphoras. And um, I think an example of a lead amphora was found on the um, Antikythera wreck. Uh, it's not been published, but I've seen it. I've seen a 3D model of it. It's, it's a big mass of lead that's rather heavy. Uh, approaching 100 kilos, something like that. And what they did was they, it, it was conical in shape and um, they would hang these from the yard arms of merchant ships to get them out over the water. And if a warship came too close, they would, um, the, the line holding them up would go through a pulley on the yard arm down to the mast and they would either loose the line from the cleat or cut it so that the amphora would plummet down on the deck of the warship 
and uh, careen down through the bottom of the ship, creating a hole and causing it to sink. That's the only time when I know of an amphora being used as um, a weapon. And perhaps that's what the questioner had in mind. Well, I don't want to put him on the spot, but it was Ted Morris and he has his camera on. So Ted, would you like to comment on that? You're not muted, Ted, but we can't hear you. No. Nope. Yeah. Uh Maybe you could uh, type it in the chat and we could find it that way. If I was running your computer, Ted, I would say it was my fault. <laughs> it tends to be my fault when I have, when I'm in, in a position to set things up. So at any, but anyway, back to the lead amphoras, um, I always assumed that they took lead and poured it into amphoras. Um, mention of lead amphoras, they called them dolphins too. Uh, it goes all the way back again, I believe, to Aristophanes, I think mentions dolphins. One of the playwrights, one of the Athenian fifth century playwrights mentions dolphins. Uh, while Ted is typing, maybe I'll ask you one of the next questions, which is, how do you explain the absence of rams for fives? Were the fives captured or swamped rather than sunk? And could the presence of fives have been greatly exaggerated by Polybius? Oh, that's, gr that's great. Um, I'll take the self-deprecating uh, one first. I could be wrong. You know, it could be all of these worship rams that we're looking at are from fives. I could be wrong. I have a whole lecture on how we know, how I think I know the sizes of warship rams. The kicker for me is that none of my ship design colleagues have been able to come up with a design uh, for a ship that'll hold 420 people based upon the timber sizes that are inside the warship ram. So I'm sticking to that story. So if that's the case and I'm not wrong, <clears throat> which I could be, um, which would be depressing because that'd be like, you know, your life's work, everything that you had worked on for 40 years and you find out after 40 years, you were wrong. Hey, it happens. Um, but if I'm not wrong, then it could be that yes, Polybius is exaggerating. And um, I have an argument for why I think Polybius is exaggerating. exaggerating. So that's that's one thing. The other thing could be that we just haven't found that part of the battle zone. And that's what my team prefers to believe. We prefer to believe that there are uh, warship rams from fives out here somewhere. And we're hoping that AUV, that yellow cigar-like object, which you program and then you set it off from your ship and then it goes for, I don't know, four hours or something on its own uh, scanning the seafloor and recording it in a, a digital format, it then comes to the surface. It's wild. It comes to the surface, sends you an email that says that it's ready for you to come pick it up. And then you go pick it up and then download the images that it has recorded over the past four and a half hours. It can be much more effective than we can be on our research vessel. We are hoping that that device and, and others like it will help us find additional portions of the battle zone. Um, battles took place over huge areas. And right now, as I said, we've got roughly a six square mile area where the battle occurred. It could be, you know, 15 square miles. It could be even more than that. So um, if you would 
try to then pin me down on why Polybius would exaggerate, I would just tell you this. Polybius, at the end of his description of the First Punic War, basically says to his reader, who is a Greek audience, he basically says, hey, if you think that you guys had big battles, if you think that uh, the Persian Wars was big stuff, if you think that the, the battles between Athens and uh, the Peloponnesians was big stuff, if you think that the, the battles that were fought with Antigonus and the successors of Alexander the Great were big stuff, you got nothing on the Romans. The Romans went from nothing to like 120 miles an hour in like five seconds. And they did that during the period of this war. And that's why you should buy my book. He doesn't come out and put it that way, but that's why my version of events is so important because I wanna tell you Greeks, you know, what amazing things the Romans have done. And then I think it's in book one, chapter 61, you can check me on this, where he says, during the course of the war, more men and resources were expended on this war than on anything the Greeks ever fought. There were thousands of warships that were built, thousands of warships that were lost. And when you take a look at how Polybius enumerates the numbers of people who fought, he goes back to the, like Herodotus figuring out that there are 5 million people in Xerxes' army, he goes back to a calculation where he says, each five, each quinquireme had 300 rowers on it. And if you multiply the numbers of ships that we know fought in this war by 300, you come up with hundreds of thousands of people who fought on both sides. Now, if you take a look at Polybius's own account of action, you find he mentions other sizes of ships. He says in one instance, oh, the, the, the quaestors inquired about uh, the fleet that was coming from the prodromoi, the small ships that sailed in front, the, how does he put it? The small ships that commonly sail in advance of the fleet. He knows there are other ships involved. If you take a look at the column of Duilius, again, it's a Augustan period, it's a later period recarving of a archaic uh, inscription that went on a Roman Republican monument from uh, one of the first battles of the first Punic War. He, he tells us that triremes are, are, uh, are, are captured by the Romans as a result of the battle that won seven a uh, uh, hectareme is captured as a result of the battle. A number of fives are captured as a result of the battle. So Polybius knows that the fleets are comprised of different kinds of warships, but not for the First Punic War. He calls the fleets penteric fleets. He says that when fleets are constructed, they are fives. And if you read most of the historians who write about the First Punic War, they're firmly entrenched behind Polybius. They believe that as the war goes on, there is a very influ influential scholar, a Dutchman by the name of Thiel or Teal. I think, I don't know whether it's pronounced with a TH or not. Uh, and he says, by the end of the war, no threes are being made at all. And um, I come to the conclusion that, that by the end of the war, who knows, maybe the fleets were largely comprised of threes because they were cheaper to build. So I think we have the potential to find out some, once we nail down surely the size of the ship that we're dealing with, I think we have the potential to nail down some interesting facts about the First Punic War that will allow us to go a little bit beyond what Polybius tells us. Great, thank you. So Ted has clarified his question. And um, first, he also asked a question about recording. And I think it would be um, helpful to say that the lecture is being recorded for those of you who had to join us late. And um, you could, you'll be able to contact Professor Murray to get a copy of that recording or a link. Um, give us a couple days though. And also, uh, Ted has a very rich family connection to the Navy and I'll let everyone read about it in the chat. But his question was whether 
the amphorae could have been containing oil, they, whether they could have been containing oil that was used as an incendiary fluid, so tossed on the deck of an enemy ship and then lit with flaming arrow. I think the answer to that is no, because the way you would toss it would be with a catapult. And we know that catapults are twitchy devices. Um, according to my research, catapults were generally brought by freighters or mercantile ships. And uh, they would be set up on, on shore. And then this is, by the way, before the Romans appear to use catapults on their warships or Carthaginians do. Um, so we have no comparable times when Romans or Carthaginians of this period used catapults. And that's what would be required to throw something that weighed 40 pounds from uh, one vessel to another. Secondly, remember what the purpose of this fleet was. This was a resupply fleet. This was a, a fleet that was designed to bring relief to a garrison that was running out of food. So um, I've often toyed with the idea, did the men on board pitch these amphoras overboard before they went into battle or not? And it reminds me of what people would do uh, during the Vietnam War, where they would dump their loads at sea. They would dump their ordnance, their bombs at sea so that they wouldn't have to go in and risk getting shot down. Um, that's not a very ho ho uh, heroic way to fight uh, a battle. And we've seen many movies where, um, you know, oh, we can't see the target. Our mission is we've got to bomb this factory. And if we don't hit the factory, many people will die. So let's go around again and we'll make one more pass. And the enemy artillery fire is blowing up all around them. And the men on board this fleet would have to have said to themselves, screw the mission, the hell with the guys on shore. Our lives are more important. Let's throw this stuff which will keep them alive overboard and let's get the heck out of here. If they were true to their mission, and we have no way of knowing whether they were or not, they would have hung on to those amphoras for as long as they possibly could before finally throwing them into the sea and um, getting away. And so I like my explanation of the, uh, what's the word, the specific gravity of the contents of the amphoras determining how they spread out rather than trying to envision you know, scores of ships with sailors going, ah, I'm scared for my life, throwing them over one by one and having them sink to the bottom. Um, so were, could they have been used as uh, items for incendiary weapons? I, I would not be convinced by that argument. Right now, I, um, I, there are still questions, but I noticed that it's six o'clock. So if you're willing to continue taking questions, I can read some more. But if you'd rather wrap up, we can do that also. No, sure. Go right ahead. I rarely get people asking me questions about this stuff. It's like my wife and my family are like, no, no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the, always the truth? <laughs> That's the truth. Well, you have quite a few more, so I'll continue. So okay. this one is a double question. And one is, what proportion of the total site do you estimate has already been searched? And also in a, a Dieck Plus maneuver, I wonder how the attacking ship did not damage its own oars in the process of destroying the enemies. Uh, those are two really good questions. One, I, I've got to tell you, I can't answer. Um, we've found 23 warship rams. All right, how many of them come from the attacking Roman fleet? I can't answer that question. I don't know. But I would think a smaller number than are represented by the Carthaginian side. And why is that? Uh, Carthaginians are at a serious disadvantage in this battle. The crews are not uh, trained. The, the crews haven't been trained to the level that the Roman crews have been trained. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, if they've put their ships to sea quickly and these Roman ships have been laid up for a period of time, it may very well be that they're uh, taking, in, taking on water. Um, 
we don't know precisely what happens to a warship when it's been laid up for eight years and hasn't been used. But if you would launch it into the water, I think by the time it got to Maritimo Island, all the seams should have filled uh, up. But again, how quickly it went to the bottom. There are a lot of interesting questions uh, about the ships in this battle um, that make my brain hurt. N normally, we expect warships that are damaged to float at the surface. That's what I always teach my students. Um, the Athenians had a law which said, if you lose your ship in a storm and you're a captain, we will let you off the hook for the ship, but we're not gonna let you off the hook for the ram. The implication being get your rear end in a ship and go out there and find that floating wreckage and bring the ram back to the naval yards. That's the way it's always been interpreted. So normally we would say warships floated when they, when they got damaged. These warships, at least large portions of them sank because the warship rams have big nails that are still in them and the nails show that they're not bent. It's, their timbers have not been wrenched away from the nails. If you've pulled two two by fours apart that you have uh, nailed together with a 10 penny nail or something like that, you're gonna bend the nail when you pull those two by fours apart. These nails aren't bent, which means that there were bow timbers attached to these warships when they went down to the bottom. So did the timbers go to the bottom because they were old warships? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so, um, now I got off on this tangent and you've got to remind me of the question because I know I was going somewhere with this. So the question was, um, go ahead, Carrie. I have to scroll back up. Uh, yep. okay. So, um, would the attacking ships not damage their own oars in the process? No, the one before that. What proportion of the total site do you estimate has already been searched? Okay. Um, I can't tell how many are Roman ships and I can't tell how many are Carthaginian. Let's say they're all Carthaginian. That's 23. Polybius tells us that 70 ships were sunk. So that's 23 out of 70. Am I going to believe Polybius's numbers? I'm a good ancient historian, so no. I, I don't buy his numbers. There are so many ways that numbers can get screwed up. So if I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna give you an answer, which is I really don't know. Uh, I suspect there's more of the battle zone to be found, uh, but quite frankly, I don't know. I, find, I feel like when I went to Santorini and I asked the excavator there, how much of the site of Santorini has been uncovered? And they told me, oh, 20%. And I thought to myself, there's no way they can know that. I could give you a number. We throw numbers out among the team, but quite frankly, I don't, I don't know. The other question is really difficult. And that is when these ships shoot the gaps, the small ships shoot the gap, gaps between larger ships, how do they shoot that gap without shearing off their own oars. The regular explanation that is given is that the men who are at the oar lean forward all the way with their oars. They push the oar all the way forward and that feathers the oars against the side. Now, I'd like to see it done. Um, we hear that it was done, so I have no doubt that it was done. I wonder if there is a way that if the ship that is shooting the gap can come in at a speed that is such that its weight, which would be 20 tons or more, if it's a three, uh, that would enable it to hit the first oar and sort of bounce raggedly along the side of the vessel at an angle to the warship that would allow the feathering of the oars on the side that is closest to the warship being attacked to not be damaged. They must have had some method for doing it. And until we can get you know, warships built and go out there or um, an artificial intelligent, intelligence guru who works for you know, one of these gaming companies can come up with something that will reproduce the physics of these ancient warships, I don't really have a good answer. They did it, 
We know they did it. They must have done it somehow by feathering the oars. Uh, beyond that, I, I'm as mystified as the question asker is about that particular one. And the next question is about the amphorae. Have, has there been any effort to trace where they were manufactured? And also, is there a publication, a current publication about the ceramics found at the site? Um, the current publication that you can look for is the answer about, there have been some analyses done of the amphoras. I do not believe that we have an elemental analysis that has been done that would pinpoint for us whether the clay was North African or Campanian or whatever. Um, there has been some analysis to determine whether or not residue exists on any of the amphoras. And I believe the evidence that came back was uh, plant protein which could be olive oil. Um, there were fats that were found associated with uh, the broken pieces of amphora that were tested. And uh, I would not be surprised at that. This doesn't answer the question about where the amphoras came from, but it, it does explain what kind of analysis has been done. Uh, with our amphora replicas, when we filled one up to the brim, in, I, I'd have to look at my notes, but it was like three or four days, more than 30% of the water had drained out of the jar. In other words, it transpired through the fabric of the jar and then evaporated away. Um, we found that with the, the jars that we used for oil, we tried to coat them on the inside with paint, with acrylic paint, uh, because we thought that would be not as authentic, but as effective as using something like beeswax or beeswax or pitch. And um, where the paint adhered well, the oil didn't leak through the jar where there were gaps, particularly up under the, the neck uh, of the shoulder of the jar, we found that um, oil leaked through and it, they became, the jars became slimy after a couple of days. All of these jars, whether they carried wheat or wine or water or oil, they must have had pitch on the inside of them. All along, I you know, believe that, oh yes, pitch was used for wine. That's why the Greeks have red Cena, blah, 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 blah. It goes back to the middle bronze age. Uh -uh. The, the way this kind of clay works when it's fired to a thousand degrees centigrade or less, stuff leaks into the fabric. So um, I, think, I think it would be interesting in the future to do some elemental analysis and that clearly has to be done. If you wanna find um, a discussion of the ceramics and it's gonna focus basically on the, the types of the amphoras. When we began the project, uh, nobody suspected that the greco italic type that we're finding dated to the mid third century BC because whole complete jars were very, very few in number. Uh, there were lots of sherds, but not whole jars. And um, now we've got sort of the big, it's lying on the seafloor, but the biggest collection of Greco-Italic mid-century jars of anywhere in the world. Um, there is a publication which is called um, the Battle of the Agate Islands. I don't know. Let me pull it off my shelf here. It's called The Site of the Battle of the Agate Islands at the End of the First Punic War. And the editors are Royal and Tusa. And it is, it's blue like that out there. I know it disappears. It's blue um, and it comes from Lerma de Brechneider. So that's, if you go to their site and look at and type in Egates uh, or Egedi, up will come this book. And in there is um, 
everything that that we've been able to determine about the amphoras up to about 2015. Okay. And there are other ceramics and the other ceramics clearly are going to have to be found. Now, I hope you'll appreciate this is unlike um, a land excavation where a lot of the stuff that we're finding, we leave it right where it is because um, there's just no space. You, you, you wouldn't bring this stuff up anyway. But um, if, if there are people who have interesting theories about ceramics that they would like to be tested, contact us. We would love for you to write a grant and uh, we'll go out there and pull one up off the seafloor for you. Uh, thank you. Um, Marcy, could I invite you to ask your question while I turn on a light? Yes, absolutely. Um, so thank you. This is a wonderful talk um, that's been iterated many times in the comments. Um, if you're if you can't hear me, please let me know. But my question, my question is about um, spoliation. And you know, we know that the Romans are taking as as often as they can, they're taking booty from these naval battles back, and they're creating rostral columns, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking of the monument for Actium in particular, but there's earlier, older rostral columns as well, the rostra itself. Um, what's the mechanism that's used for retrieving the, I feel like you started to answer this in referring to um, Athenian custom of retrieving the ramming, the, the ramming prow. Um, but how exactly are they doing this? Do we know? Thank you. Um, normally the way that you get yourself um, a worship prow is that you, capture a warship complete that's floating, and then you take it ashore and you take off all of the fittings on it that would be of use to you, and then you burn the ship. And we know that the Romans did this sort of thing. Polybius records that um, the Romans would, would burn extra ships that they captured from the Carthaginians. That's one of the big ways you do it. You can also, after a battle is over, um, you can go through the wrecks and if um, the wrecks include items of value, then you will grab those things and, and pull them up. I, mean, I don't have good examples for Roman uh, use of this, but during the Hellenistic period in, in Diodorus, I believe, we have evidence of, um, and maybe it's fighting against the Romans. We have evidence of um, warships that were put out of action and were swamped. Um, I think the verb used is diaphtherein. So they're destroyed. And um, they sent swimmers over with ropes that they tied to the vessel and then with great energy and difficulty, they dragged it back to the beach where they uh, pumped the water out and then refit the, the warship. So we know that despite these examples, I, 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 my suspicion about the Egeti warships is that I think the sea conditions had something to do with why the ships broke up so much and, and how you could still have timbers associated with the, the warship ram that would then sink to the bottom and keep those attachment spikes straight. It may very well be that the ship was broken up by the swell and by the rough surface that Polybius tells us existed and, and that that contributed to the breaking up. There's, there's also a particular maneuver that is used by both Romans and Greeks, uh, which is like, I, the verb is like suntribane, which is they, they pound away at the wrecks after the battle is over. So they will come with a group of ships and literally pulverize what remains so that it can't be dragged away and reused. And that could account for s some things. But if the sea state was rough, no one's going to be hanging around out there to you know, pulverize warships, particularly if the remainder of the fleet turned around and went away and the relief supplies never get to the garrison, then your strategic objectives have been achieved and you might as well go back to shore. 
get a drink of water, or get something to eat. Thank you. Um, Anne, could I invite you to ask your question as well? Well, a lot of it has already been answered through your later discussions. I enjoyed the talk very much. And I've actually sort of forgotten my question, but it was about Polybius and my reading of Polybius from many years ago. And in my memories of his account, you know, it was really kind of David and Goliath. Here the Romans didn't know how to sail. They had to learn how to sail. They didn't know about ships. They found the ship. And so then they had to learn to sail that one. And then right. they went out and it was just, and so I was just kind of mesmerized when all of a sudden you say that, that the Carthaginians, who I thought of as these great sailors, went out and they sent out these boys who were not well trained and they were using Roman ships, you know, and so it just, it sort of turned that whole picture around for me. You've made other suggestions since then that you may not want to repeat, but basically my question is, um, is there a kind of larger dimension which we need to review Polybius's account then from this, from this um, discovery? I don't want to gang up on Polybius too much, simply because um, if you think about the Athenians at the end of the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians at the end of the Peloponnesian War are not the kinds of naval experts that we see at the beginning of the war. And, and we've had a 27 year period of time for uh, um, Spartan admirals to get better for Spartan crews and Peloponnesian crews to get better. So um, the theory, by the way, about uh, Polybius, if you, if you want to read it in a fully developed form, you would look at um, a book by Krista Steinbe, which is called Rome versus Carthage. That's kind of the, the general treatment of it. She also has a... Uh, um, another work that is, um, I don't know, Finnish Academy of Sciences or something like this, but the Rome versus Carthage book, which you can get on Amazon is, is the best treatment of this. And her first couple of chapters talk about um, how Polybius is misleading concerning uh, how much the Romans knew at the beginning of the war. And, and her belief is that uh, this, this impression that we get from Polybius's account is misleading. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not correct. And she maintains that the Romans were, um, she, she may take it a slight bit too far, but I still am with her most of the way, where she concludes that the Romans were a maritime power by the middle of the third century. And that, of course, they, you know, if, if you take a look at their their offices, they, they add um, uh, naval quaestors. Again, it's a very, very late source, but uh, quaestores classici um, in the, the first date is 267. And that's, I believe, <laughs> pardon? There was a question? I think that was ah. a straight comment. <laughs> ah, well, at any event, 267. Um, prior to that, there, there is a group of uh, two men who are the duoweri nawales, the, the two men in charge of the fleet, and they date to 311 BC. And, you know, in most historical accounts, we say, oh, well, the Romans have this. She, she interprets that as being the introduction of triremes, a trireme navy into Rome around 311 BC. And what those of us do who teach about ancient navies, the minute you have a trireme navy, you've got yourself purpose-built warships that are good for no other reason but to serve as warships. And that's when the state has got to build them, the state has got to maintain them, the state has got to crew them. So that means already by the end of the fourth century, the Romans are decided consciously like the Athenians did back in the 280s, they consciously decided they're going to build a state-maintained navy. Now we could say that they weren't as effective at it as, as the Athenians were, and probably that's true. But her point is Polybius goes overboard. And I guess you would probably agree with me in saying he goes overboard because he wants to make 
the point to his Greek reader that uh, the Romans are truly amazing and deserve to be pay, paid attention to for this reason. Thank you. So the next question might have been partially answered, but it's given that the Carthaginians had decisively won the naval battle at Drapana at two, or in 249, why didn't they have sufficient numbers of trained soldiers and oarsmen in 241? Uh, the, the quick answer to that is, you, if you know anything about the Athenian um, expedition to Syracuse, you know what happens is, is that a fleet can deteriorate within a year. Um, it takes a very, very short period of time for uh, one of these ancient fleets or ancient navies to, um, to deteriorate. The next thing is true for all naval powers, and that is navies are very expensive. And most governments don't like to maintain navies if they don't have to, the United States included. So after World War II, what do we get? If you've ever been to uh, the Philadelphia Naval Yards, you know what it's like. If you ever fly into Philly, you take a look um, as you're flying into the airport, you go over, you know, line after line after line after line of mothballed ship. And, you know, they couldn't be put back into service again. They're there because I guess it's cheaper to have them there than it is to cut them up or sink them or turn them into reefs or whatever. They represent a Navy that we had at one point that was much, much more numerous than it is today. So if you capture a whole bunch of ships in 249, and you want to keep it uh, active until 241, you have to, as a budget manager, you have to decide that the money that you expend to keep the fleet active is worth it because your strategic objectives are worth it. So how much does it cost? Okay, we don't have good examples for Rome, but we've got good examples for Athens. If it costs you a dollar to build a ship, it costs you a dollar, and these are for triremes, presumably quinqueremes would be even more expensive. But if it costs you a dollar to build a trireme, it costs you a dollar to run the trireme every month. So it means if, you, if you've got your uh, triremes in your hands and you want to, and it costs you, a, you know, $200 to build a 200 fleet Navy, it's going to cost you however many months, $1,800 to keep that 200 ship fleet at sea for nine months. You have to decide, particularly if your resources are becoming more and more limited, as we think is happening both in Rome and in Carthage, you have to decide whether it's worth keeping those fleets active. And if it's not, you take the ships and you put them in ship sheds and then you refit them when the time comes if you need them. And it's going to cost you some money to refit them, but it's also going to cost you money to get the crews together. You can have crews together in 2021. And if we go to 2000, it's like a football team. You know, I'm very pleased that uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl this year. But you know how it works. You can't keep that same team together. I mean, New England figured out how to do that. That's why we all hate New England so much. Um, but if, if, you know, most, if, if history is our guide, the way the business works, you can't pay the salaries for all those guys who won the Super Bowl. You can't keep them together. So you don't have teams or navies or whatever that stay at peak performance for five, six, seven years, unless you're paying the guys constantly. So I guess that would be my answer to your question about how it is that the Navy can degrade over a relatively short period of time. Now, Sarah Horvat has an interesting comment and I'm not sure if she's still here and wants to elaborate on it, but she does say that from an artist's perspective, the rams remind me of chisels and carving tools used for patterning and to remove large areas before detailing, whether in stone or wood. So I think that what she's suggesting is that they function almost the way that a chisel would. And by that, she means the, the blades at the end? I think the fins is what she means. Fins. I think. Um, they have been described as chisel-like, that's for sure. 
So that would imply if that's the case, that they were intended to cut into the wood, although you've got the, the vertical piece, which is going to, I guess, increase the size of the damage of the hole because the, the horizontal fins will make slices like a knife cutting into butter. And then that horizontal wedge-like piece is gonna like blow out whatever it is you're, you're cutting into. So very nice observation, yes. And I think that that takes us to the end of the questions, unless anyone has any questions that they haven't put in the chat. It looks like John does. Um, yes. Before I turn it over to John, uh, one thing I'd like to remark on is that you, um, when you get a chance, you should look at the chat because you have lots of accolades. Everyone really, <laughs> really, really enjoyed the le lecture. And I have to say that I did too. Go well, ahead. Thank you. So I will look at the chat. I'll hang around and take a look at the chat. Oh, good. Yeah, because uh, you got uh, admirers from all over. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, on the, um, the last remark about the chisels, uh, another thing to look at are, are log splitters and, and just uh, to see how they're designed because uh, it, it might be a very similar type of a thing. That's, uh, a, that's a good observation, um, a log splitter, because the, the timber that you're thinking of splitting would be split by that up and down piece um, and, and the timber that you're thinking of splitting again is that larger whale timber that runs along the side of the vessel. Yeah and, and so the other thing I have is that maybe you actually have evidence here for, for those big fives um, and what I'm thinking of is the uh, count and Thucydides of the Battle of Salamis where the queen of Halicarnassus or Artemis or something. She's got to get free and she just runs over other ships in, in order to leave. And I'm thinking maybe the, the Romans had fives at this. Uh, and if you're, as your image initially, uh, the, uh, running a eight, 18 wheel uh, truck against a compact yeah. vehicle. Yeah. Uh, if, if they are in fact broadsiding the, uh, the littler ships and just shearing them in half, just just riding over them like a locomotive through a school bus or something like that, uh, then that would help to explain the fronts of these boats falling off intact without the, the nails twisting or, or anything like that, because it, it's, it's not this head on uh, kind of, except in those cases where you see the scarring on them. But, uh, but it, it would just be a debris field uh, because it was just total devastation and the fives didn't really even get a scratch on them. Um, but the whole fronts of boats would just fall flat into the sea and the stuff that was on the deck would just, you know, get scattered in the waves and the rough seas would, would disperse it. Um, that's the story I would try to tell. That's the, um, the story that I've sort of adopted for this, which is, you know, why those ships sank so quickly is that um, a squadron of Roman fives ran into a mixed squadron of Roman and Carthaginian threes and just bulldozed them to the bottom, smashed them to the bottom. Um, we'd still love to find at least one of those larger rams so that we can say, well, something like that must have happened. And until we do, I guess we won't know, but uh, John, I guess I would say I tend to agree with you in that interpretation, at least at this stage of our research. Uh, another thought that occurred to me is, you know, um, if the debris field, and it seems like it's gonna be the case, it turns out to be even uh, really, really a lot bigger. I think that's the direction it's going. I, th I think you'd have to start thinking about, you know, whether this was really a, a weather event more than a battle and that the, the Romans just ended up on the lucky side of, of uh, you know, just a monsoon or something like that. Uh, well, I guess time will tell. Yeah. We'll just have to see, you know, and that's the one interesting thing about serving on an archeological project is you find stuff and, you know, rather than answering all your questions, it tends to like answer one question, but raise 10 more. And it's fun. 
Yeah, it is fun. It is. A, it's a lot of fun because what you're doing is you're you're engaging with the texts in ways that um, are new, and and that's fun. I mean, all of us who are involved in the classical world are fascinated with trying to get into the mindset of the people who produced this evidence that we're studying. And um, this allows us in a very tangible way to do that. And that's, um, that's exciting. Yeah, I, you know, I think you're in an interesting position to do a kind of a character study on Polybius, or at least to inform somebody else who would be interested in do, doing that. Uh, I think you've, you've learned kind of a lot about him in, the, in this process. I have I have uh, an, uh, a chapter in this publication which explains the warship sizes and why I feel they are the way they are, and I think um, Marcy mentioned something about the um, uh, the Actian evidence. So I rely upon evidence that comes from a war memorial built by. Uh, Octavian after his victory at Actium. So it, that's all laid out there. So if if you're interested, um, uh, Marcy or anybody else, set, shoot me an email and I've got a PDF of it. I can send it to you. Well, that's all that I had. Is anybody else has a last minute question? Oh, Marcy has, has a hand up. No? Okay. Oh, you're clapping. <laughs> all right. Uh, I can't survey everybody who's here at the moment to see if anybody has anything. So if, if anybody has anything to say, you could I just think it's safe to wrap. Up. Yeah, I think it's safe to wrap up. All right. Well, then thank everybody for their attendance, uh, for their uh, questions, comments, and uh, thanks especially Professor Murray for a really engaging talk. So uh, join me in applauding him and uh, Thanks again. It was good to see you. Thank you all for your interest. I appreciate <laughs> it. So now I'll look at the chat. Yeah, it'll take you a while. <laughs>